Welcome back to our lecture series, Math 3130, Modern Geometries for Students at Southern Utah University. As usual, I'll be professor today, Dr. Andrew Mizzelnine. In lecture 24, we then start the incredible journey that is the search for a rectangle, the quest. Uh, a noble band of heroes will come together to search for the elusive rectangle. Well, what's so elusive about rectangles, one might ask. Uh, this is sort of a fundamental shape that many kindergartners, you know, draw pictures of and can, you know, they can identify rectangles amongst other two-dimensional shapes. Why do we need to search for a rectangle? Well, okay, let me give you a little bit of backstory here. So geometers for centuries believed that Euclid's fifth postulate, which of course is equivalent to what we are now referring to as the Euclidean parallel postulate, although our version of the Euclidean parallel postulate is actually due to Playfair. Um, but none, and so the Playfair version of EPP was the one that says that given any line, any point off the line, there exists a unique line passing through that point that's parallel to the original line. So this uniqueness of parallel statements. Um, Euclid's fifth postulate, this is the postulate that Euclid had assumed in his text, the, the elements here, and the idea of Euclid's fifth posture was sort of the following. If you have a line and you have two lines that cross the line and on the side where you have two acute angles, uh, let's make sure we spell the word acute correctly here. Um, when you have these two lines, that is to say you have two lines that are transversed by some other line, call it L right here. Um, on one side of the line, if you get two acute angles, then eventually these lines have to intersect each other. Thus you form a triangle uh, is, is what Euclid's fifth postulate then gives us. Now, Playfair's version of EPP is logically equivalent to Euclid's fifth postulate in the realm of neutral geometry. So while this is our version of the Euclidean parallel postulate, for centuries, geometers were trying to prove Euclid's fifth um, as a theorem of neutral geometry, because if you get this one, you get this one over here. And, but if you get this one, then you get this one. It doesn't matter because they are logically equivalent to each other. Okay, now many attempts were made to prove uh, to prove Euclid's fifth was a theorem, um, but all have failed, right? You know, you can think of like Indiana Jones right here, and how many people tried to drink the Holy Grail? Well, we know at least one dude in the movie, and it didn't end well for him, right? He picked the wrong one, right? You never were able to finish the quest. Uh, they couldn't find, they couldn't find a proof for Euclid's fifth postulate. Now, in the process of doing so, um, a lot of geometers discovered equivalent forms to Euclidean, to Euclid's fifth postulate. Playfair's version of EPP was one such thing. Um, one equivalence to the Euclidean parallel postulate would be that the sum of angles in every triangle is always 180 degrees. Um, another statement equivalent to that, surprisingly, is if one triangle sum was 180 degrees, then all triangle sums were 180 degrees, and that has to be Euclidean geometry. The Pythagorean theorem is equivalent to the Euclidean parallel postulate. Uh, we have... Uh, that the converse to the alternate interior angle theorem is equivalent to the Euclidean parallel postulate. And many of these we will prove uh, later on in our lecture series when we talk about Euclidean geometry. So there's all these different, all these different theorems that were equivalent to the Euclidean parallel postulate that geometers tried to prove. And in this lecture, I mostly want to talk about attempts made by Sicari uh, to prove the existence of rectangles because um, Sicari knew that if a rectangle existed, then we have Euclidean geometry because the existence of rectangles in neutral geometry actually is equivalent to the Euclidean parallel postulate, believe it or not. Now, of course, before we get into that, I do have to tell you that the story didn't end so well. And I, I, maybe that's not the right perspective. Now, if you were Sicari and you're trying to prove the existence of rectangles, you'll be disappointed to find out that rectangles didn't exist. Uh, because, in fact, we have that Beltrami proved the opposite. Um, in fact, Beltrami proved the independence of the hyperbolic, uh, excuse me, I, sh I should say that Beltrami proved the independence of the Euclidean parallel postulate to neutral geometry. In particular, Beltrami constructed a consistent model of what we now call hyperbolic geometry, proving that you can't prove Euclid's fifth postulate as a theorem of the neutral axioms because you could also get hyperbolic, which those two statements are mutually exclusive. You can't have Euclidean and hyperbolic parallel postulates. So if there is a neutral geometry that could be hyperbolic, then that means your neutral geometry 
neutral trauma issues don't have to be Euclidean. And so we have to stop proving um, Euclid's fifth as a theorem of neutral geometry because it can happen. But nonetheless, a lot of important things were discovered along this journey. So, of course, the discovery of hyperbolic geometry was one of the most important uh, mathematical discoveries of all time, particularly in the realm of geometry. But nonetheless, I don't want us to feel bad about Sicari or Lambert, uh, who will be, be two people in Lecture 24 we're going to talk about um, their efforts to prove the existence of rectangles. But for now, we'll prove we'll prove why this is the case later on. Uh, but for this, for the moment being, we want to search for a rectangle because if a rectangle exists, then we have the Euclidean parallel postulate. And so in order to find a rectangle, Sakari started studying quadrilaterals, which we nowadays refer to as a Sakari quadrilateral. So let me define this. Now, the definition of a Sakari quadrilateral makes sense in congruence geometry. We don't need a notion of measure or continuity to do this. Um, a Sakari quadrilateral uh, will be denoted as ABCD. It's a quadrilateral such that, well, let me first draw my picture here and label sides, then I'm gonna give you some other things to under, uh, let me first label the sides here. So we have A, we have B, we have C, we have D here. Whoops, I forgot the fourth side here. Uh, when we draw a Sakari quadrilateral, I would generally draw it something like this. Uh, basically, what Sakari was trying to do is come up with a rectangle uh, without assuming it was a rectangle, basically. And so what he did here is that he assumed that the angle A and B in this quadrilateral were right angles, and he assumed that the segment AD and the segment BC are congruent to each other. Now, a little bit more vocabulary here. The segment AB is commonly referred to as the base of the Sicari quadrilateral. Um, the, the, the segment CD is often referred to as the summit of the quadrilateral. And the sides AD and BC, which are, which are by definition congruent to each other, these are referred to as the legs of the Sicari quadrilateral. Okay, so the segment that connects the two right angles together um, is the base, and the segment that connects the other ones are called the summit. Um, these angles right here, C and D here, these are referred to as the summit angles of the Sicari quadrilateral, like so. And so what I want to do in this video is prove some congruence properties about Sicari quadrilaterals. Now, if you're curious, why did I draw this thing sort of curved, sort of sagging? Uh, well, honestly, in a hyperbolic geometry, a Sicari quadrilateral is not a rectangle, believe it or not, because the angle sum of the quadrilateral is strictly less than 360 degrees, a topic we mentioned beforehand when we talked about the sicari legendre theorem, same Sicari in that situation there. Um, in hyperbolic geometry, quadrilaterals have angle sums strictly less than 360 degrees, and we're going to see in a second that well, I, I, we don't even need to see that yet, that um, if the angle sum is less than 360 degrees, you can't have four right angles because that would be an angle sum of exactly uh, 360 degrees. That doesn't happen in hyperbolic geometry. Okay, so what can we say about some Sicari quadrilaterals? Well, this first proof, uh, this first proposition will be a proposition um, in congruence geometry, like I said. Uh, we just need the axioms of congruence, betweenness, and incidence to make this to make this precise. So in, in congruence geometry, the diagonals of a Sicari quadrilateral are congruent to each other. What are the diagonals? So the diagonals are the lines BD and CA, like so. We claim that these are congruent to each other. Um, likewise, we're going to prove that the summit angles of a Sicari quadrilateral are congruent to each other as well. That's the main thing that we're, we're after here. So let's look at the diagonals for a moment. Um, there, so when you look at the Sicari quadrilateral, we have by assumption that segment um, AD and BC are congruent to each other, okay, like so. And if you look at the triangle, look at the triangle ABD and BCA. So if you take ABD, uh, that's the wrong one, excuse me, ABD like so, look at that triangle. It has the base, it has a leg of the triangle and it has a right angle like so then look at the triangle whoops look at the triangle a b c like so this triangle has the base of the quadrilateral which the base is obviously congruent to itself it has a leg of the quadrilateral um, which by assumption is those the two legs are congruent and we do have a right angle here and by euclid's fourth postulate all right angles are congruent to each other so these two triangles here ABD 
and B, A, C are congruent to each other by a side angle side situation. So this then implies that the segment B, D is congruent to the segment A, C. Like so. And I'm, of course, taking the whole diagonal right here. So that gives us the first statement. These segments are congruent to each other. Now I want us to look at the triangle this time, A, C, D, like so. Uh, ACD. Notice that this triangle has this diagonal, which we've then we've now proven that the diagonals are congruent. It has a leg of the triangle, which by assumption legs are congruent, and it involves the summit angle, like so. Uh, not the summit angle; it's just the summit itself. And so this triangle has that. Of course, summit's congruent to itself. If you look at the other triangle, DBC, like so. Like I said. It has a diagonal, the diagonals are congruent, it has a leg, the legs are congruent, and it, they both, both of these triangles have the summit, which is congruent to itself. So by side, 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 we get that these two upper triangles are congruent to each other. And so just like we did before, right, we knew that the diagonals were congruent because corresponding parts of congruent triangles are congruent. We can do the same thing now with these triangles here. The summit angles are corresponding angles but in this triangle congruence, and so therefore angle D and angle C are congruent to each other. Pretty nice, right? So there's a lot of symmetry going on with regard to this Sicari quadrilateral. Uh, another, another proposition that I'm actually going to leave, uh, I'm going to leave this proposition as a proof to the, to the viewer here, but in congruence geometry, we have that the segment joining the midpoints of both the summit and the base of the Sicari quadrilateral, this is called the altitude of the quadrilateral. So I first should draw this picture here because um, this, this is a theorem with a definition in it. Uh, so we get something like this. So I keep on drawing my Sicari quadrilaterals to look hyperbolic. And this is to help us remember that they're not necessarily... They're not necessarily uh, rectangles because we could be in the hyperbolic geometry here. Okay, so we have the Sicari quadrilateral. AD is congruent to BC, the legs, in that situation. Okay, so the first thing we want to first, first do is have the definition here. And actually, even before I say the definition, I didn't want to point out here that since the legs of Sicari quadrilateral have a common perpendicular, right, the base is perpendicular to both legs of the... Uh, the, the, because the base is congruent to both, not congruent, it's perpendicular to both legs of the Sicari quadrilateral, that actually gives us that the Sicari, that the legs of the Sicari quadrilateral are parallel to each other. So it's noteworthy to mention that the line um, AD, which is the leg on the left, is going to be parallel to the leg BC on the left because they have this common perpendicular to the base. That's a consequence of the alternate interior angle theorem. Now, what we're going to do here is we're going to take the midpoint of the base. Um, we're going to, and let's call it maybe M or something like that. Do I give it a label here? I don't, but yeah, we'll, we'll introduce it here. We'll call it M. And then we'll take the midpoint of the summit. We'll call it N. And we're going to take the line segment that connects these two points together. So again, these, this is, um, these are midpoints. So M, um, it cuts in half the, the base. A, M is congruent to B, M. And then the, the point N is going to be the midpoint of the summit so that D, N is congruent to N, C. So that's what we mean by the altitude in this situation. So then what this proposition claim here is that the altitude is perpendicular to both the base and the summit, like so. So that's, that's what I'm going to leave it up to you to prove um, in this video right here. Uh, prove that this the altitude is a common perp perpendicular to the base and summit here. And just by the same reasoning we said a moment ago, the altitude will be a common perpendicular to the base and summit. So then it becomes an immediate consequence of the alternate interior angle theorem that the base AB is parallel to the summit DC uh, because they have a common perpendicular. And so what this tells us about Sicari quadrilaterals is that Sicari quadrilaterals are an example of a parallelogram. What is a parallelogram? Well, a parallelogram is going to be a quadrilateral. Um, a quadrilateral. I first had the right parallelogram on the screen, don't I? Um, a parallelogram is going to be a quadrilateral that opposite sides of the quadrilateral are parallel to each other. So this proposition gives us this altitude um, and establishes that Sicari quadrilaterals are going to be parallelograms to each other. And I want to mention here that the proof is basically done. 
really, the, the proof is basically one line. And that's because we're going to use the side angle, side angle, side uh, congruence uh, criterion for quadrilaterals, for which in this lecture video, we have, not in this video, but in this lecture series, we've, we, we I shouldn't say we proved it, but we took side angle side as an axiom of triangle congruence. Um, in the homework, I've left it for my students to establish the notion of, of quadrilateral congruence, for which you can, since you can dissect, you can dissect every quadrilateral into two triangles. Um, you can then kind of put the congruence of the two triangles together. And so you can get this so-called side angle, side angle, side uh, quadrilateral congruence. And so this proposition basically is an immediate consequence of side angle, side angle, side. But I'll allow the viewer to provide the remaining details here. Um, a few other things I want to mention about security quadrilaterals before we sign off in this video here. Uh, we have a theorem. And this is, in fact, going to be a theorem in neutral geometry. The notion of measure is going to come into play here. All right. Um, in particular, we're going to use the Sakari Legendre theorem. Not surprisingly, Sakari, you know, worked through what we now call the Sakari Legendre theorem um, as he was studying quadrilaterals. So, in neutral geometry, the summit angles of the of a Sakari quadrilateral cannot be obtuse. Uh, well, he wanted them to be right angles because if they were right angles, they would be rectangles. Uh, but because of hyperbolic geometry, you can have a Sakari quadrilateral with acute um, summit angles. But at least by the Sicari Legendre theorem, Sicari was able to show that the summit angles cannot be obtuse. And how is that? Well, we've basically talked about it already. Um, we already have seen, as a consequence of the Sicari Legendre theorem, that a quadrilateral's, a quadrilateral's um, angle sum cannot exceed 360 degrees. Maybe it does equal 360 degrees, but it could potentially be smaller than that. All right. Let X be the measure of a summit angle inside of a Sakari quadrilateral, then we get the following. Well, a Sakari quadrilateral has two right angles, um, A and B, what we were calling them before. So 90 degrees plus 90 degrees gives you 180 degrees. We also know that the summit angles of a Sakari quadrilateral are congruent to each other. So we have two summit angles, so we get two Xs. So 2X plus 180 equals, well, has to be less than or equal to 360. If you subtract 180 from both sides, you're going to get that 2x is less than um, is less than 180 degrees. Divide both sides by 2, then gives the implication that x is less than or equal to 90 degrees. So it could equal 90 degrees, perhaps. And then in that situation, your security quadrilateral would be a rectangle. That's what Sakari wanted. And so you can then see why was Sakari interested in the Sakari Legendre theorem, because this was a necessary tool to help him eliminate the possibility of a Sakari quadrilateral that's not a rectangle. He said that he proved that the angles can't be obtuse, but he was never able to prove uh, that the angles couldn't be strictly acute. Um, because that's what this that's what this theorem allows for us, right? Um, the summit angles of a Sakari quadrilateral they could be right, giving us a, rectang a rectangle, or they could be acute. And as we will see, the summit angles being right, that is, the existence of a rectangle, is equivalent to the Euclidean parallel postulate, and the angles being acute is equivalent to the hyperbolic parallel postulate. And so these different possibilities give us the so-called acute, uh, the acute angle hypothesis. So the acute angle hypothesis is the assumption that the angles of a Sakari quadrilateral are, the summit angles are always acute. That's equivalent to the hyperbolic parallel postulate. Um, we of course also have the right, uh, the right uh, angle hypothesis, uh, which is going to be equivalent to the Euclidean parallel postulate. Sakari couldn't distinguish between those possibilities. Um, the last possibility, of course, is the obtuse angle hypothesis. Um, are the angles, the summit angles of a of a Sakari quadrilateral, are they obtuse? Well, a Sakari quadrilateral we could define just using notions of congruence. We don't even need to have a congruence geometry. That is, uh, the between these axes were not necessary to define a Sakari quadrilateral. Um, and so using, so basically if we have a geometry which has side angle side, um, we can then prove the summit angles are going to be congruent to each other. So could they be obtuse? Well, it turns out that if you have this setting of where Sakari quadrilaterals are going to be obtuse to each other, this is going to be congruent to the elliptic parallel postulate. Now, what Sakari was able to do is prove that the obtuse angle hypothesis is inconsistent with the neutral geometry 
axioms, but he couldn't separate the acute angle from the right angle because of hyperbolic geometry. The acute angle hypothesis is possible in neutral geometry. Okay, one last result I want to prove about Sakiri quadrilaterals in this video is the following. In neutral geometry, the base um, in a Sakiri quadrilateral is less than or equal to the summit. And this is actually why we've been drawing the Sakiri quadrilaterals the way we've been doing it. Let's draw our picture right here. Now, we honestly don't need the picture for this proof, but I just did want to draw it on the screen here so we can see it. The way that I'm drawing um, my summit on this Sakari quadrilateral seems to suggest that it's like it's 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 hanging right you know sort of like a, a wire there's some type of sag going on there um if you look at that it would appear that the summit is longer than the base for which they could be in fact equal to each other like if this was a rectangle opposite sides are congruent to each other but it could be that the summit is actually longer than the base and this is something we can prove in neutral geometry. Now, if the summit and base are congruent to each other, that actually implies the right angle hypothesis, which implies the Euclidean parallel postulate. If the summit is strictly longer than the base, uh, then that actually would apply the acute angle hypothesis, which implies the hyperbolic parallel postulate. Um, if perchance the summit was shorter than the base, uh, that actually would apply the obtuse angle hypothesis, hypothesis, which gives us the um, elliptic parallel postulate, but in neutral geometry, we can't get the elliptic parallel postulate. Uh, that's inconsistent. Um, so consider the following situation. We have our security quadrilateral A, B, C, D, and consider the diagonal B, D, like so. Um, well, there's basically three possibilities that we have to consider. Um, consider the angles A, D, B, and B, C, uh, D, B, C, excuse me. So A, D, B is this angle right here, and then the angle... Uh, DBC, DBC would be this angle right here. Um, it could be that these angles are congruent to each other. If these angles were congruent to each other, then these two triangles, ABD and uh, CBD, would be congruent to each other by side angle side, uh, which then would give us that their corresponding sides, which are the, in this case, the base and the summit, they would be congruent to each other. So in that situation, uh, we would have our statement. They are actually equal to each other. Be aware that this situation, we've actually assumed, believe it or not, that this assumption is going to give us the Euclidean parallel posture because the assumption there is going to get that the summit angles are both um, right angles. Uh, this is the right angle hypothesis. Okay, not a problem. Another possibility is that what if angle ABD, this one right here, what if it was less than angle um, angle DBC right here. Well, then when we look at these two triangles, because these two triangles do have congruent sides, the diagonal was congruent to itself, and the legs are congruent by assumption. Um, in this situation, the hinge theorem then applies, uh, which then would tell us that the segment AB, it, which is the base, is less than the segment DC in that situation. Um, and so that also is compatible with what we have written here. We have a less than in that situation. So if you're assuming that ADB is less than DBC, you're actually assuming, believe it or not, the acute angle hypothesis. This situation, you're going to get the hyperbolic parallel postulate. Okay? So lastly, consider the situation where angle ADB is greater than angle DBC. So again, the same two angles are in consideration. Now we're just changing our mind who's bigger than the other one. Uh, without going any further here, you might be able to suppose that this hypothesis here is actually assuming the obtuse angle hypothesis, aka you're assuming the elliptic parallel postulate. That seems like it should be inconsistent with neutral geometry. Aha, we're going to get a contradiction in this third case with the Sakiri Legendre theorem. So consider the sum of the angles um, ADB plus angle A plus DBA. So what are our angles in play here? So we have ADB, which is this angle right here. We have angle A, which is this angle right here. And we have DBA, which is this one right here. So we're just looking at this lower triangle and we know that its angle sum needs to be less than 180 degrees. Now angle A we know is a right angle, like so. Um, and so we can, we can make that substitution here. Um, we also know that angle D a, B, this one right here, is complementary to angle uh, D, B, C, uh, because their union forms angle B, which is a right angle. So we get that uh, D, B, A is the complement to the angle D, B, C. 
So some things to mention here. Of course, if you take 90 plus 90, add that together, you're going to get 180 degrees. But also our assumption, angle ADB is less than angle DBC. So I can replace ADB with BD, DBC, and that'll make things get smaller. That's how our assumption comes into play. And like I said, 90 plus 90 is equal to 180. So this sum right here is greater than this sum, DBC. Uh, plus 180 degrees minus DBC, but the DBCs then cancel each other and we end up with 180 degrees. So the sum of the angles is greater than 180 degrees. That doesn't happen. The Security Lagrange theorem forbids that. And this is something we mentioned earlier, right? That if you have the elliptic parallel postulate, that is, if you have the obtuse angle hypothesis, that implies the angle sum of triangles will be greater than 180 degrees. Uh, that's inconsistent with the Security Lagrange theorem. So that third possibility is eh -eh, not possible here. And so therefore, uh, by the Security Lagrange theorem, the base of a security quadrilateral is always less than or equal to uh, its summit.